Hey everyone, it's James from The Fit RV, and in this video, we're gonna have kind of an entry-level chat about RVing in the winter. RVing in the winter is more challenging, but to my mind, it's also more rewarding than summer RVing. By the end of this video, you won't be a winter RVing pro, but you should have a pretty good understanding of what to look out for and how you might be able to pull it off. And if I've done my job right, hopefully I've got you interested enough that you'll think about giving it a try. Now, like the others in our RV basic series, this video is sponsored by our friends at Winnebago RVs. But the information we'll go through here is not Winnebago specific. It should be applicable to literally any RV out there, motorized or towable, new or old. So a big thank you to Winnebago and let's get started. Normally, this is where I'd stop and tell you to read your owner's manual for additional information and that the manual should be the final word on what to do if you're unsure or if you find conflicting information. But I can't do that in this case because the things we're going to talk about, for the most part, won't be found in your owner's manual. That's right, we're going to be coloring way outside the lines here. So your RV manufacturer probably didn't put this stuff in the manual, not because it's a bad idea, but just because they never thought you'd actually try it. So, many of you may be wondering right now, why on earth would I want to go RVing in the winter? Well, Steph and I just love winter RVing, and there are several reasons why, but the main reason is probably easiest to explain with a few pictures. This is Zion National Park in the summer. And this is Zion National Park in the winter. This is a state park in the summer. And this is a state park in the winter. Are you noticing a pattern here? Because we certainly do. And that's probably the biggest reason why we like to go RVing in the winter, to escape from the crowds. We really enjoy being able to visit beautiful places where we can take it all in in our own way, in our own time, not have to worry about getting up at the crack of dawn to make sure we can get a spot to camp or even just a place to park. We like it less crowded, and maybe you will too, but that is not the only reason we like winter RVing. We also like that RVing in the winter opens up experiences that you just can't get during the summer. Now, obviously, I'm talking about things like skiing, snowshoeing, snowboarding. Those all come to mind, and we've done our fair share of those. But even some place where you've been a thousand times can transform into something new and cool with a dusting of snow over it. Bryce Canyon National Park here in Utah is known for this. Another sort of practical reason we like winter RVing is that boondocking, or getting off the grid altogether, is actually easier in the winter. Think about it. You don't need air conditioning in the winter, so you won't need a big battery bank or a generator in order to be able to use your RV. And that, by itself, could open up new possibilities for you. And finally, if you're a three-season RVer and you start using your RV in a fourth season, well, right there, you're getting a 33% more value out of your investment. Bonus! So now that you're hopefully interested, you should know that winter RVing is not without its challenges. So I'm going to share some tips to get you started. 10 tips. No, 11 extra value from the Fit RV Winnebago video. And do pay attention because some of these tips we learned the hard way. And trust me, you don't want to do that. The first and by far most important winter RVing tip, this is kind of the, the mother tip from which all the other tips will flow, is this. Know your rig. Here's the thing. You can successfully winter camp with literally any RV. Now, it's true the capabilities of that RV will determine some of what you can or can't do, but successful winter RVing is like 10% about the RV and 90% about the decisions you make while using the RV. And if you want to make smart decisions, you can't really do that if you don't know the details about your rig. So what kinds of details am I talking about here? What do you need to know? Because we're not talking about like knowing that the color scheme of your rig is called Hebes Bruneus. No, the stuff you need to know are things like where are your freshwater lines exposed to the outdoors or where do they run through unheated compartments? What is your battery capacity? What are your heat sources in your RV and how much of what kind of power do they use? Which of your storage compartments are heated? And how are they heated? Which fixture drains to which tank and where are those tanks located? Those are a few of the big ones and you'll pick up on a couple more as we work our way through this. 
Now, knowing these things is going to enable you to make smart decisions about what to do or not to do in a winter camping situation. How will that work? Well, so for example, let's say you have a toy hauler, you know, with the garage in the back, and you know that the water lines to your rear bathroom run underneath the RV where they can freeze. In that case, you might elect to keep the water shut off from that part of your RV, or if you know you've got, say, limited battery capacity, you might decide not to run tank heaters off of batteries and instead save the tank heaters for when you have electric hookups. And that, in turn, could help you make some decisions about where you're going to camp and how long you're going to stay there. Now, it might seem, at the front end of it, it might seem like a bit of a challenge to figure all this stuff out about your RV. And depending on how well things are documented for you, it may take you a while to learn all this. But once you know it, you know it. You're not going to forget it. And you can then look forward to a lifetime of smart decision making when it comes to winter camping with that RV. So there you go. That's the first and the biggest tip. Know your rig. Now, the second big tip about winter RVing is probably the one that most people could guess, and that has to do with water. In the winter, water freezes. Shocker, yes, we all know that. But when water freezes inside your RV, it can burst pipes, it can push apart seals, it'll cause water damage when, you, when it thaws, etc., etc., etc. And even if nothing actually breaks, you still don't want to be surprised by something like the supply line to your toilet freezing solid. And before you ask, yes, that has happened to us. So, Figuring out your water strategy is one of your first winter RVing tasks. And this is something that really needs to be done before you leave home on each trip. And depending on the trip you have planned, you might handle it differently for each trip. So broadly, there are two basic strategies for managing your water on a winter RVing trip. Number one, don't use it. Number two, use it. <laughs> and you actually have two plumbing systems in your RV to consider. There's fresh water and wastewater. I know this is like super simple stuff, right? But like most things in RVing, none of this is actually hard. It just might be things you haven't thought of before. So let's take the first strategy, don't use it. That means you won't be using your RV's onboard water during your winter RVing trip. If there's no water, it can't freeze, right? So if you wanted to go down the don't use it path, that means your RV will basically need to be winterized in whole or in part before the trip, and then you just don't add any water to the RV, and then there's not going to be anything to freeze. Now, this is not a video about winterizing specifically because that can get kind of detailed in particular depending on your RV model, but you do kind of need to know what winterizing is. Basically, winterizing is the process of getting the water out of your RV so it won't freeze. Usually, this is done as part of putting your RV into winter storage, but since we're nut jobs who have decided to go winter camping, this now becomes something we need to think about as part of our trips. There are two general approaches to winterizing your RV. The first, and the one that I do, is to use compressed air to blow all the water lines out and blow all the water out of your RV. Empty water lines can't freeze. The second approach involves pumping RV antifreeze all throughout your RV's fresh water system so that even if it does get super, super cold, the water lines won't swell and burst. And I suppose there might be a third way to winterize, and that would be like to drive to Florida or something. But if that's your game plan, then most of this video doesn't apply to you anyway, and you're just watching so you can rub it in. <laughs> so now, back to that don't use it thing. What does that look like in practice, like when you're actually out in the RV? Don't use it. Well, your RV is going to be winterized, so your water lines are going to be okay. But you, you the occupant, still need water. So this strategy will have you bringing along bottled water to use while you're in the RV. So you'll bring along bottled water like for drinking, but also for brushing your teeth, hand washing, maybe dishwashing, stuff like that. That's not too bad, it's somewhat less convenient, but you can still get the job done. You could also look for strategies to reduce your need for water in the first place. You could say switch to paper plates and disposable cutlery for a winter RV trip. That's not a super green option, but again, it gets the job done and for a one-off trip, that might be just the ticket. Well, that's the fresh water, but remember, we also have wastewater. Let's say if you're going to not use it, you don't want to get wastewater tanks full and drain lines freezing up either. So if you're winterized, those are going to start off empty, except for maybe a little RV antifreeze. How do you keep them that way? Well, for washing dishes and hands or brushing your teeth, it's easy enough to put a bowl or a dish pail in your sink and then dispose of that water someplace appropriate. 
For showers, the don't use it approach will have you looking for campground showers or maybe showers at a local gym or something like that. And for the toilet, you could use campground facilities and just not use your toilet. That's one way to do it. But there are other ways. Like if you have a composting toilet in your RV, that doesn't have any plumbing at all. So you can continue to use that just like always all throughout the winter. We had a composting toilet in our van for five years for that very reason. If you have a cassette toilet, like we do in our Winnebago Echo, there's no waste plumbing there. The cassette is in the heated space. So you might decide to flush your cassette toilet with bottled water and then just empty the cassette as necessary, just like normal. And you could always investigate bringing along something like a porta potty or something just to save you from having to schlep across the snowy campground in the middle of the night. That would work too. Any of those would work actually, and we've tried most of them to some degree or another over the years. And for occasional trips, that kind of thing might be fine. But if you decide you really dig winter camping and you want to do more of it, then not using the water becomes a bit more of a bother. So let's look at the second strategy. And that is you're going to actually use your RV's water systems while winter camping. What does that look like? How do you do it? Well, basically what you're going to need to do is evaluate your rig for both the fresh and wastewater plumbing systems and determine where things might be vulnerable to freezing. This is really part of that know thy rig commandment from before. Once you've identified those potential trouble spots, you're going to need to do something about them so that you don't have to worry about them freezing. For the most part, that means you're going to be learning about tank heaters and heat tape. Now, sometimes RVs come from the factory with those, but a lot of times those are aftermarket add-ons and you'll apply them to your RV's exposed plumbing elements to keep them from freezing. That's sort of an easy-ish RV mod, but if you don't feel like tackling it, any RV repair or service shop should be able to install those. There are tank heater pads, which are something you'll apply to the underside of any exposed tank. So here you can see the tank heaters I applied underneath our van. And then I went out and took an infrared picture on a cold day. And you can see they really do keep the tank contents a lot warmer than their surroundings. If you apply tank heaters to your tanks, please do remember that you'll also want to apply similar but smaller heaters to the drain lines from the tanks. If you don't, you could wind up with like a liquid black tank but then those contents are going to be held up behind a block of ice in your dump valve. And then you're going to frantically drive to the home center to get one of those jet engine heaters. <laughs> and you're going to set it up blowing under the RV with boards around the sides to keep the heat in. And then once you think it's thawed, you're going to knock that down and drive like mad to the dump station so you can dump before it freezes again. Not that I would know anything about that personally. That's just what I hear can happen sometimes. Besides the tank and drain pipe heaters, you may have fresh water lines that need to be heated as well if they pass outside your RV or if they run along an exterior wall. They do make a cut to length heat tape that you can apply to keep those lines from freezing as well. Now, the tank heaters and heat tape, those are great, but they don't run for free. They do use electricity to run. So what does that mean for your winter camping? As an example, the tank heaters I had installed on our last RV lands used about 13 amps of 12 volt power when they were turned on. So before we upgraded to lithium batteries, that meant if we weren't on shore power, we had to pay close attention to when they were turned on and how much energy was left in our battery bank. If you're plugged into shore power though, or maybe running a generator, you ought to be able to handle the energy demands of heat tape and tank heaters without any trouble. A Couple of other points about these heaters, they're not like instant on kind of things, like you can't flip them on and expect them to turn a frozen solid black tank into liquid in like a few minutes or anything. They're more like slow, gentle heating to just like 40 degrees or something barely above freezing. So keep that in mind. You need to turn them on more than like five minutes before you head to the dump. And finally, the heaters will be more effective if the tanks and water lines themselves are insulated and in a warmer part of your RV. That's just common sense stuff. The next tip, I guess this is tip number three, is to know the limits of RV antifreeze. Now you've heard me mention this stuff a couple times now, but the name is deceiving, antifreeze. Just based on that name alone, you might think that it doesn't freeze. You'd be wrong, it does freeze. And if you don't believe me, pour a glass of the stuff and put it in the freezer. There are plenty of videos on YouTube where people have done just that. It can start getting slushy at around 20 degrees, so it does freeze. But what it doesn't do is expand and burst your RV's plumbing, and that's why people use it. 
But if you don't know this, you might pour RV antifreeze down your shower drain, thinking it will keep your shower drain flowing at minus six degrees. You'll find out that you're wrong when you're undressed and in the shower, ankle deep in a tub full of rapidly cooling water. Been there, done that. So RV antifreeze does freeze. And if you start mixing it with water or toilet waste, it actually freezes much quicker. So if you get advice to just flush your toilet with RV antifreeze and everything's gonna be okay, take that with a grain of salt or maybe a lot of grains of salt because adding salt to your waste tanks actually would reduce the freezing point. But that's not a tip. Don't, don't do that. Don't go brining your RV's tanks. But RV antifreeze does have its place. In our own RV, when I'm putting it away in the winter, I pour RV antifreeze down the drains to replace the water in the traps with antifreeze. That way the traps won't freeze and burst. So it's still useful for storage, just not so much while you're actually using the RV. So that's the tip. RV antifreeze, it's no silver bullet, but it is a useful tool as long as you understand its limitations. Our next tip might sound a little silly, but it's keep the heat on. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean to think of your RV like a house and not a car and to keep the heat on accordingly. So like in the winter, you might leave your car at the airport for a week or more with the heat off and that's okay. It's built for that. It'll be fine but you wouldn't go away for a winter vacation and turn the heat off in your house, right? The pipes would freeze. Same thing goes for your RV. Think of it like a house, not a car, and keep the heat on while you're using it. But besides protecting your plumbing from freezing, there are other good reasons to keep the heat on. Your RV might have heated storage bays or other areas that are heated passively just from the heat of the living space. Keeping the heat on keeps those spaces working as intended. Our own Winnebago Echo has a heated garage that has a heating duct back there, but it doesn't work if we don't keep the heat on. Also, if your RV has batteries that are in a heated space of the RV, then keeping the heat on will keep your batteries working more optimally. I think most folks have heard that lithium batteries are kind of sensitive to cold, but even regular lead acid batteries, they have less capacity in colder temperatures. They charge more slowly in the cold, and in a worse case, they could actually even freeze. And then finally, there's our cat, Mel. Mel is very appreciative that we keep our heat on during the winter. And if you bring your pets along on RV trips, I can guarantee you that they'll be thankful you keep the heat on as well. Our next tip is kind of a negative. It's kind of a don't tip. And that's never use fuel burning or catalytic heaters inside the living space of your RV. Ever. Period. For any reason. These heaters are not somehow immune to the chemistry of combustion. They still consume oxygen. They still produce carbon dioxide and some carbon monoxide. They have to. That's how combustion works. Now, you will see and hear of people on the internet who will tell you, I use my Mr. Heat Blaster in my RV all winter, every winter, and I've never had an issue. You will never see a post from anyone who used such a heater in their RV and had an issue. Think for a minute about why that might be. So I remind you to not pay attention to the internet people, which is ironic because I'm on the internet right now, but to remind you of this, we have this picture of a poisonous eyelash viper that I took on a vacation to Costa Rica. Now, you might think that I took this picture from a safe distance with a zoom lens, and that is what a smart person would have done, but that is not what I did here. Having never seen an eyelash viper before, I thought, what a pretty snake, and I walked right up to it just inches away and took a picture, complete with flash. Now, the fact that I somehow survived does not mean that that was intelligent behavior that you should try to emulate. Quite the opposite. So now, when someone advises you to use a fuel burning heater inside your RV, you can think of me popping a flash six inches from a pit viper and just remember, yeah, that's not smart. Our next tip, what's this, number six, I guess, is to keep the heat in by dealing with drafts and cold spots. There's more good news than bad news here. We'll start with the bad news, and that's that every RV is unique and it's gonna have its own set of areas where things get drafty or cold. There's no way I could know these and tell you, so you'll just have to kind of find them yourselves. That's the bad news. The good news is that once you find these spots, the way that you'll deal with them really isn't that much different from what you might do in your home. So like throw rugs come in handy, right? Draft blockers, you know, those long insulated things that you might put at the bottom of a door. When we were in vans, I used to put these in the crack between the, the two metal doors in the back, you know, because that was a very drafty area. 
insulating tapes and other kinds of insulation, they probably all already have a place in your draft fighting arsenal at home, and they work exactly the same in your RV. The even better news about this tip is that there are two darn near universal quick wins that should apply to just about every RV out there. The first of these is to do something about your single pane glass windows. A single pane of glass is not such a great insulator. It has an R value of about one. Here you can see some infrared photos I took of our last RV on a sub-freezing morning, and by far the warmest spots on the outside of the RV were the single pane windows. So if you have single pane windows in your RV, and all of us with motorized RVs do, probably the biggest bang for your insulation buck is to do something about those. There are a variety of products you can use. Rigid foam boards, flexible foams, other insulation with backing. These days I'm using Thinsulate, but one thing I would advise you to not use is Reflectix, that tin foil lined bubble wrap stuff. That does not work well for insulating your RV against exterior cold. It can work okay for keeping radiant heat out of your RV if you have it against an air gap in the summer, and I promised Steph I wouldn't get on my Reflectix soap box. So enjoy this picture of me in a tinfoil hat, and that will kind of tell you exactly what I think about Reflectix. So insulate your single pane glass, but not with that stuff. Now, the second universal quick win is to do something about the roof vents in your RV. And here again, you can see some pictures, infrared shots of roof vents. And big surprise, the thin plastic cover offers very little in the way of insulation. And every RV I have ever seen has at least one 14-inch fan opening in its roof. Great for ventilation, not so much for keeping the heat in. Now, for these, there are a number of commercial products available. Pillows, vent covers, and the like. They're not expensive, and they do work. You don't have to invent anything here. Just go and buy something that will cover up your vents and provide some insulation there when you're not actively using the vents. Next tip, since I just mentioned vents, it's a good time to talk about moisture management, which, if you haven't thought of it before, winter RVing is definitely going to put it on your radar. <laughs> Here's the deal. The things you do in your RV, like showering, cooking, heck, even breathing, they all produce moisture inside your RV. In the summer, it's less of a big deal, but in the winter, when the warm, moist air you just breathed out comes into contact with a super cold window or another cold surface in your RV, it will cause condensation, just like the water on an icy glass in the summer, except from the inside out or outside, in, whatever, you get the idea. Over the years, I have tried a number of things to deal with moisture in the RV with varying degrees of success. I've tried dehumidifiers, and the larger compressor dehumidifiers, they work somewhat, but they take a good bit of power to run. The smaller, cheaper Peltier effect dehumidifiers that you'll see all over Amazon or whatever, those do not work at all. Save your money, they're garbage. I have actual data from an experiment I ran that shows how terrible these things are. They're, they're, they're worse than Reflectix, which is saying something. Um, I've tried bags of desiccant, like, you know, silica powder kind of stuff. Those just don't seem to be able to keep up with two humans and a cat in the RV, and our windows are still soaked in the morning. Keeping warm air circulating and moving over surfaces that are prone to icing up, that does seem to work a bit. But sadly, the one thing that really does work is to keep your window and roof vent cracked a bit to allow the warm, humid air to escape, which is unfortunate because basically you're letting out heat as well. So you're just kind of choosing the lesser of two evils, I suppose. Anyway, the point here is to be ready for the moisture, know what's gonna happen, and do what you can to reduce it. Now, personally, what do we do? Is we always actively vent the RV, like with a fan and a cracked window, when we're cooking or showering. As far as sleeping, what we do there is going to kind of depend on how much of a humidity problem we anticipate. And we live in Utah, so it's not as humid around here as some other places, but it can get quite cold. Now, you'll eventually build up experience here and let that guide you, but until you have that experience, bring along a few extra towels on your winter RV trip. Tip number eight. Eight? Eight. Energy management is different in the winter. What do I mean here? Well, over the summer, you'll get a pretty good handle on how much energy it takes in your RV to do certain things, like how much battery does it take to keep the fans running all night, that kind of thing. 
but your calculations will need to change in the winter in a number of ways. First, let's take the heater. In the summer and in like the shoulder seasons, you might maybe run the heater for an hour or so in the morning to knock the chill off. But in the winter, you're gonna be running that heater a lot harder than you do in other seasons. So quite naturally, it's going to use more fuel. So if your propane tank lasts a month in summer RVing, in the winter, it might only last a week. I don't know the exact ratio for your rig, but it will be different, so expect it and plan for it. Solar, also different in the winter. If you have solar panels on your rig during the winter, the sun is at much lower angles in the sky, and so the amount of energy that you can recover with solar is quite a bit less than during the summer. And that's not even thinking about what happens if you get snow on your panels. Even if you keep them properly cleared of snow, you're just gonna get less energy from solar in the winter. Propane is particularly interesting in the winter. In your tanks, propane is a liquid, LP, liquid propane. But your appliances burn propane as a gas. That means the propane has to vaporize or to boil, essentially, to convert from a liquid to a gas. Well, vaporization requires heat. And there's less heat in the winter, so the propane is going to vaporize more slowly. Now, the boiling point of propane is like minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit, so at most reasonable RVing temperatures, your propane system should still work but it's gonna vaporize slower. So you might find that say, if you're running the heater, the water heater, and the propane cooktop all at the same time, some of those appliances may struggle a bit if it gets really, really cold. So just keep that in mind. And finally, batteries. I've mentioned them before, so just be aware that batteries will have reduced capacity in the winter, particularly lead acid batteries. Lithium batteries have their own set of temperature restrictions for cold weather charge and discharge, and that's kind of a whole rat hole that's its own video, and I don't want to go there now. But most better lithium batteries should have a BMS that will keep the batteries from self-harm in colder temperatures. The Lithionics batteries in our Winnebago, for example, they take this a step further, and they have internal heaters to make sure they keep operating in the right temperature range. At any rate, whatever kind of batteries are in your rig, they will have reduced capacity or they'll require special care in colder temperatures. Know that going in and you can avoid unpleasant surprises later. Tip number nine, nine times. Be prepared for everything to be more difficult during the winter. Remember I mentioned at the beginning that nobody really thinks you're actually going to do this, right? So all those services that RVers depend on to make life easier, they're going to be more difficult to access during the winter. Like campgrounds is the big one. Campgrounds may close. That's the thing. Even if they don't close, they might just shut off the water. So finding places to camp and places to get water are both more difficult in the winter. Same with campground bathrooms. Those are often closed during the winter. Dump stations are another convenience that are often inaccessible during the winter. And you can't really blame the dump station operators for this one. I mean, if somebody makes a mess at the dump station and it freezes, Who's gonna clean that up, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't blame them for closing those up. But some are open, they're just more challenging to find. Propane filling may be harder to find in the winter as well. We once went to a propane fill station that was perfectly willing to sell us propane on New Year's Day, but they couldn't because their hose was frozen shut. And finally, if you're planning to boondock or camp off grid during the winter, the roads may be unplowed, unsafe, or just downright impassable during the winter months. So everything is gonna be more difficult. The way to deal with all of those is to just plan yourself options, backups. Um, sure, pick a cool off the grid campsite. Don't let winter stop you, right? But then also have an alternate nearby in case that one doesn't work. Something like a commercial RV park where you know it'll be plowed and open. If the dump station is closed, have a backup in mind, like an interstate travel center. Those usually stay open. We were blindsided by that frozen propane thing and drove 70 miles out of our way to propane, to find propane on that occasion. So you, you do what you have to. But the point is to be ready for things to be difficult or closed and just be flexible and roll with it, which is weird for me to say. But Okay, tip number 10 has to do with winter driving. Be ready for it. All of those winter driving tips that you've heard and filed away in your head over the years, they still apply when you're out in your RV only more so. So you all know to allow more distance, you know, between you and the car in front of you in the winter, right? Well, in your RV, allow even more distance still. All those winter driving tips, they're the same, they're just magnified. 
And usually you'll kind of feel this intuitively when the snow starts flying and you're sitting in the driver's seat, so pay attention to your gut. I would encourage you to investigate snow tires. We've often swapped out our summer tires for winter ones in the past. Um, carry tire chains. In some places, it's mandatory to carry the chains even if you don't need to use them, so pay attention to that depending on where you travel. And things to bring. You probably have an ice scraper or a brush in your car. You should have one in your RV as well. Preferably one with a longer handle to adequately clear your windows, and a snow shovel. Carry a packable snow shovel, particularly if you're going all off-road, but also even if you're not. We once overnighted at a ski area that allowed it, and it snowed about a foot overnight. But the plow guy apparently didn't get the memo and took issue with us being in his parking lot. He bulldozed about five feet of snow around three sides of our RV. No kidding, up to the windows. We had not brought a snow shovel. So the next day, Steph spent about six hours using a cutting board to claw our RV out of the snow. I really wanted to help, but we only had the one cutting board. So while Steph dug us out, I had the most amazing powder day ever, so that really sort of worked out for everyone. But yeah, bring a shovel. And finally, tip number 11. Other RV videos, they go to 10, but when you need that extra push over the cliff, this one, it goes to 11. The final tip here is to put your RV away right. And this gets back around to winterizing again, but here's the thing. If you decide you like RVing in the winter as much as we do, then that means you're going to be winterizing and dewinterizing multiple times over the course of the winter. Now, I can tell you from experience that it is no fun standing in your driveway when it's 18 degrees and dark, rinsing things out and dealing with water. So you want to develop some smart strategies for winterizing and dewinterizing as quickly and with as minimum of fuss as possible. Now for us, this means never putting RV antifreeze in our water lines. One, because it takes time to put it in, but also two, it takes a lot of time and water to rinse it out again when you want to use your RV the next time. So if you can do it safely and effectively for your RV, I always recommend using compressed air to winterize. It's faster and it requires less water on the flip side when you're trying to dewinterize. You will want to use some RV antifreeze with that method though, as I've mentioned, I just use it in the drains to keep the traps from freezing shut. I don't know the particulars of your RV, but there are probably other things you can find online to make the winterizing and dewinterizing process easier and faster. And here is a genius level nugget for you. Whatever your winterization strategy winds up being, it is much easier and a lot more pleasant to practice it or to try out a new winterization tip when it's fall and 50 degrees outside and daytime. So if you can, try those things out ahead of time. And there you have it, our best tips for successfully RVing during the winter. It might sound like a lot right now, but once you've done it a few times, much of this just becomes second nature. And regardless of what type of RV you have, I hope you found something here in this pile of tips that you can use, and I hope you'll give winter RVing a try. So from us and from our friends at Winnebago, we'll see you on the road. Have a great RVing winter.